I should get my other blanket. It's cozier, but this one will do. Okay. <laughs> my house is cold, Sam. It's the middle of winter, and I don't have an actual heating system. I know, Danielle. I just love you. are like, how snuggly do I want to get? <laughs> Pretty snuggly. This is why I yawn while you talk. Yeah, because this is your problem, Danielle. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Book Retorts. I'm Sam. I'm Danielle. And this is the podcast about finding weird media to share with your friends who really don't know what you're talking about. Woohoo! Yes, get excited, Danielle, because today I have for you a book. I know, crazy. <gasps> crazy. Today I'm going to share with you the book Shark Shock by Donna Jo Napoli, Napoli, one of those. Shark Shock. What? Shark Shock? Shark Shock. Okay. A literative book. A book from 1996. What kind of book is it? Young adult? Old adult? No, younger adult. <laughs> <laughs> it is for your third to sixth grade, basically. Oh, good. Getting yeah. Younger grade media. Woohoo! And I know that means this might seem a little harsh to be on the show, but nah. it's actually... <laughs> Nah, no, of course not. It's a it's a good book. I enjoyed it. I remember reading it when I was seven, eight, something like that, and being very confused by it. And it wasn't until I was looking up this book for this podcast, trying to find a copy, when I realized it's actually a sequel. Oh, which, well, yeah, that would yeah. throw things off. It would have explained a lot. I'm like, who are these people? Why should I know them? Why do they all seem to have relationships I don't understand? <laughs> He's so, such a smart little eight-year-old. Yeah, sure. The point is, I'm going to share it with you the same way I experienced it, with no context. <laughs> <Okay>. So, <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I haven't read the original Soccer Shock book, and I don't intend to, because I kind of enjoy Shark Shock existing as its own sort of weird window into this world without any other context. So the first one's called Soccer Shark? So Soccer Shock. Shock. Sorry, You'll that is there. really hard to say. <laughs> yeah, shark shock is a bit of a thing. We try to say soccer shock and shark shock. Soccer shock. Okay. Is it a sports thing? Is the shark shock a sports thing? No. Just, is, is, do we know? Danielle, Danielle, so Danielle, you're asking questions. We'll get to it. I promise we'll get to it. Okay. All your questions will be answered. Probably not. But that's <laughs> not the point. The point is most of them will at least be addressed. Okay. Let's do this. Shark shock. So the reason I really like this book for this podcast is that it is a pretty standard, you know, children's book. It has morals and all that kind of very sort of mundane, slice of life stuff. But it also just has this really weird insanity running through it mm. that we'll get to. And I just love the juxtaposition of, hey, nice, you know, Beverly Cleary style slice of life about this kid. And also, here's some crazy stuff just for fun. That is kind of just there. I like that you tied morals into being mundane. <laughs> I just mean that, like, every children's book has morals, which is good. That's supposed to be teaching kids morals, but it's not like – I wouldn't call that weird for a podcast. Like, oh, no, this book has a moral. How weird is that? Well, it depends on what the moral is, I guess. Well, of course, but this is your standard sort of friendship acceptance stuff. Nothing but with that sharks. Would, kind of. Let me just give you the description, Danielle, so you can stop asking questions. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I need to know. <laughs> All right. There you go. So it says, Shark Shock offers a lighthearted but realistic look at the fears of contemporary children of 19, what was it? 96. 1996, that they encounter as they grow up. In this companion to Soccer Shark, Soccer Shock, You'll get there. so hard? I don't know why I would say Soccer Shark, which sounds like a totally different movie, like an Air Bud <laughs> style shark movie. No. Okay, in this companion to soccer shock, Adam and you his family it. head to New Jersey for well well deserved summer vacation. Who goes to New Jersey for a summer vacation? Oh, I have that in my notes, Danielle. Don't worry. <laughs> Only Adam is reluctant. Oh, I was like, who's Adam? I'm not paying attention. My gosh, Danielle, this is going to be a very long episode. I forgot the character's name you read three seconds ago. No, sorry. His friend Grayson presented a horrifying report on sharks before school was out, and now Adam fears for his life in New Jersey. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay, over the course of the summer, Adam learns that although he can't deny his fears, he can put them in perspective, just as his newfound friend Seth does. Seth, two years Adam senior, continues to explore and experience life in spite of his natural fears. <laughs> yeah, I had to edit just a little bit out to keep some surprises, but... <laughs> 
<laughs> that should give you an idea. All right. Let's see. Let's get on yeah. to the summer New Jersey vacation. Everyone wants to go to New Jersey for the summer vacation, Danielle. Believe me. All right. So we open this book with a kid, Adam. He is in school listening to a presentation on sharks by his friend, as you've no doubt just gathered from that description. His horrifying report. Yeah. It is horrifying report, which actually isn't that horrifying <laughs> and is probably not that accurate based on what I read in this. <laughs> I mean, the guy says, Grayson says in this report, if you grab a shark by its tail, you can pet it, which maybe... I don't know if I would use that as my go-to plan for sharks. Like, oh, I'll just grab a shark by its tail. They're totally docile. Maybe it works. I don't know. But it seems like you should know a little bit more about sharks than just grab them by the tail and you're totally cool. I thought you were supposed to punch them in the nose. Well, I don't know about that one either, Danielle. I'm not a shark expert. Someone who's an ichthyologist, please call us. <laughs> so Adam is very uncomfortable with the idea of petting sharks. He is not about sharks. He doesn't like sharks. He is deathly afraid of sharks. Grayson gives more facts about sharks. They don't die of old age. They almost never get sick. They have to die from choking on porcupine fish or something. This kid's presentation is weirdly specific. And I, again, I don't know how accurate it is. They don't die from old age? Is that true? We, okay, I really do need an ichthyologist or sharkologist. <laughs> These are all things that I know that they don't usually get like cancers or things like that, but right. I don't know about the rest of it. And so he is presenting is all the, these facts. The entire plot of Deep Blue Sea is that sharks with Alzheimer's and cancer. Anyway. <laughs> Danielle, we're not talking about that movie. Not now. <laughs> it's a shame that we've both seen that. Yes, it is, because that'd be a great movie <laughs> for Shark Week. But alas, <laughs> we're here and we're talking about questionable facts presented by an 11 year old kid. So again, I don't expect his presentation to be dissertation level accurate, but it'd be nice to at least have some basic facts that are verifiable. Which maybe they are. You didn't do your research, Sam. No, because I don't care. <laughs> it's my job to report on this book, not on this book's accuracy. <laughs> okay, continue on. Questionable shark facts. Not that horrifying. Adam hates this. He doesn't like any of this presentation. He hates thinking about sharks. He wants to be outside playing soccer. And then this bomb is dropped that Jaws the movie was based on a real shark attack. <laughs> Uh -oh. And Adam is not happy about this. Did he think shark attacks didn't happen? I think he knew shark attacks happened, but I think he was just horrified at the notion that the horrible, scary shark in Jaws was quote unquote real. Had he seen Jaws? Maybe that's why he had a fear of fear of sharks. <laughs> yeah, and I have in my notes, what little kid has seen Jaws? I mean, <laughs> like, I was probably like 12 when I saw Jaws. Well, Danielle, you are not a good barometer for what <laughs> movies kids should see. <laughs> it's probably true. You also saw like, The Exorcist at 12. I was not. I was 21. So Sam. <laughs> oh, oh, really? And that scared you that much when you were 21, Danielle? It was a creepy movie. That was the last movie that scared me, so. All right. Anyway, moving on, the presenter wraps up. There's another presenter who goes up and she talks about the Great Barrier Reef. But Adam doesn't pay any attention since he'd rather be outside. This is the last week of school, so on and so forth. And then the teacher dismisses them saying, since the public pools open this weekend for the summer, there'd be no homework. And I don't see how those are related. No. Why does a pool opening mean, yeah, there's a pool that opened, public pool, so no homework. So, like, what? <laughs> so everybody can go play in the pool, Sam. Yeah, this, this book also makes some wild assumptions about how much time everyone <laughs> spends at the public pools in their area. <laughs> oh, you know what? When I lived in... Where is this based? <laughs> Michigan. Is it? Because yeah. when I lived in Michigan, <laughs> we spent a lot of time at the public pools. <laughs> well, maybe it's a Midwest thing, Danielle, because <laughs> we had lots of public pools where I grew up too, and we did not spend literally every day there. Okay. Well, I lived down the road from a small water park and some public pools, and we went there quite a bit. Fair enough. Here I am learning. <laughs> So I'm going to be on his side. Maybe people, I don't think school like shuts down and there's no homework so you can go to the public pool, but it is a thing. We'll get to the public pools in a minute. But first, Adam has to get home. Mm -hmm. And on his way home, he sees his friend Gordon playing a quote, unquote, fancy portable video game machine. <laughs> Those fancy portable video game machines. <laughs> so this is where it gets kind of weird because it's like my grandmother describing them. <laughs> And it tells us that it's a Game Gear, like a Sega Game Gear, and a name drops an actual name of a portable video game machine, which is always weird when books sort of use actual brand names just sort of out of nowhere. Yeah. But then after Adam asks his friend Gordon what's he playing on there, his friend says he's, he's saving up for a game called Ninja Jai Den, uh -huh. which is 
not a real game, but it's close to a real name called Ninja Gaiden. Right. And I don't know if the author just didn't care and didn't look up what the actual name was or like, we got the license to use Game Gear, but we couldn't get the license to use Ninja Gaiden, so we had to change the name. Is that the name? Uh, I'm not familiar with the game, but does the word mean something or is it the name of a character or something in the um, story? I think it means something. I don't know. I'm getting, I haven't played the game either. I never had Sega or PlayStation's for playing Ninja Gaiden. Well, and I mean, I'm just curious if changing the name of it changes the entire... Meaning? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't speak whatever, probably Japanese, that it's based on, or if it is, in fact, a word or not. I have no idea. Just Maybe curious. someone who, who is familiar with the Ninja Gaiden franchise can tell us. <laughs> We've got a lot of questions, and it's only yeah. like five minutes in. <laughs> We're like... Not even for the first chapter, Danielle, please. <laughs> Continue. Anyway, so Adam asks if he can play. Gordon hesitates because the new present. And then Adam takes it as a cue that maybe you shouldn't have asked to play with someone's new present and quickly backtracked, which is, shows a level of sort of emotional maturity I'd not expect in an 11-year-old. Yeah, impressive. Which is great because Adam is at once very emotionally mature and kind of an idiot in every other respect, <laughs> well, which I really enjoy. 11 for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, except for the emotional maturity. I was not an emotionally mature 11-year-old, I can tell you that. Oh. I know a, I know an emotionally mature 11 year old. <laughs> Well, good for them. So anyway, as mentioned, Gordon wants that ninja game but can't afford it, so he comes up with a scheme. He says, and quote, Let me see. The game I want costs $45. I've got $5. If I sold shares in it for $5 each, then all I'd need would be eight other people and I could get it. Which, first, that's some quick math. That's some second, high level math, yeah. <laughs> second, why is this kid talking like Alec Baldwin and Glenn <laughs> Gary Glenn Ross? Because, <laughs> like, somebody sell shares in my video game futures to these other children. I'm impressed. <laughs> they know what shares are <laughs> right, exactly like this is like oh this kid's destined to be some you know crazy stockbroker wolf of wall street thing going on here <laughs> adam correctly points out that then the other kids would then own a piece of his game and could demand to play it at any time it would cause conflict if two people want to play at the same time which again crazy knowledge about how shares work <laughs> couldn't you just like sell it time time well, shares like so then he suggests it'd be better to rent time on the device exactly. for say 50 cents a, a piece so these kids are really good <laughs> entrepreneurs they are going places this is what i'm getting from this little exchange yeah that's amazing good job yeah i know i, I read this in the first chapter like what these kids again it's so weird how they sometimes talk like mature adults about certain things and then also actual children in other ways it's wild so adam gets home and he sees his mom who tells him they're going to a cookout at the pool for dinner now danielle as a michigander <laughs> <laughs> do they go to cookouts at the pool? Like, do the pools just have random cookouts for hot dogs and hamburgers? I'm not aware of. I do not recall them ever having a cookout at a pool. There was definitely like concession stands or we'd yeah. have picnic lunches, but no, I don't remember. Actual, like, like barbecue cookout. Yeah, I guess if it was maybe in some kind of public park space, but no, I never went to a cookout right. at a pool. See, I'm learning. Thought I could be your Midwestern guide. Yeah. So Adam has two sisters, and his mom suggests that now that his little sister, who's going to be in first grade, his mom might go from being a part-time substitute teacher to a full-time teacher. Adam is ambivalent at first, but then gets distressed that he might have to come home to an empty house. Oh, no. no Change is hard for kids. I mean, it is. Change yes. is hard for adults, too. We prove that every day. Yes. But this book will focus on that aspect, kind of. <laughs> okay. So they go to the pool. Adam has his younger sister, Nora, and his older sister, Catherine. And Adam goes straight for the high dive, dives in the pool and races his friend Grayson around the lap pool. But then Adam collides with another kid who calls him a turkey, <laughs> which is a great insult, I guess. <laughs> Such a turkey. He's like, you turkey, you ran into me. Like, all right, well, wow, vicious. <laughs> I'm going to start calling people turkeys. Go for it, Danielle. It's apparently a Michigan thing. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not <laughs> even in what? 1997? Is that what Six, Danielle. Six. <laughs> Six. <laughs> so I'm going to be telling you a lot of things that sort of happen in this book that aren't relevant to the plot at all, that are sort of there to give the slice of life feel this book has. It's almost like it's trying to be dandelion wine, uh -huh. just like this slice of life, but kind of less interesting than dandelion <laughs> wine. <laughs> It's not bad. Again, it's for children. So I get it. Anyway, Adam gets out of the pool and he's thinking about sharks and he creeps himself out because like, oh, there are no sharks in the pool, which is good. So I guess I'm okay. And then he goes to find his parents. Also, I didn't mention this earlier, but his parents are always addressed constantly in the book as mommy and daddy. Every time it's mommy and daddy, even when it's like narration. And I find that weird. But <laughs> that's me. That's a choice. <laughs> It is a choice. So Adam's older sister says he should put on sunscreen since he has freckles and that skin cancer is going up everywhere, which is true, 
but a real downer. <laughs> I mean, if you have freckles, chances are maybe you should put on sunscreen. I'd say it's a good idea, but maybe his 13-year-old sister shouldn't be like, cancer is going around everywhere. And then she does a speech later about like, oh, and pollution, the world's dying. I'm like, wow, this kid is real bleak. Well, she's not wrong, but it's bleak. <laughs> she's that kid, though. Like, everybody knew a 13-year-old like that. That's true. Fair enough. So while they're eating the at this pool cookout Michigan thing, apparently. <laughs> okay. <laughs> not all things you're unfamiliar with must be Michigan things in this in book. In this book, I'm going to insist they are. <laughs> Everything I don't get from this book is because it's a Michigan thing. Sometimes it might just be the author being weird. No, I mean, I have absolutely no context for anything about Michigan. I'm going to assume that everything weird in this book is just a Michigan thing. Okay, well, I'll tell you if you're wrong. Don't at me. <laughs> so the dad announces that he's rented a cabin on the New Jersey shore for three weeks for a vacation. And I put in my notes, not the first place I think of. So but... this, did Michigan, do they know anybody in New Jersey? No. They just decide, like, out of all the places in the entire country they could go to they're like we should go vacation in new jersey yeah that's a massive trip for a michigander yeah it's a big like, trip you go to like ohio if you're traveling <laughs> it's gonna be an eight to ten hour drive at least sure and I, to we, then be on the new jersey shore renowned for its beauty <laughs> yeah and i like my family used to travel a lot and we would do 10 hour trips over the weekend but we wouldn't go to new jersey <laughs> <laughs> I should be fair to New Jersey. New Jersey is a lovely state. There's many fine qualities, but I don't think it's a number one tourist destination in the United States. I'm sorry, New Jersey. Especially for Midwesterners. What an odd choice. Maybe that was the other state the author was familiar with. Well, the reason they made this choice is because Adam gets distressed because of sharks and the fact that the shark attack that Jaws is based on happened on the New Jersey shore. Oh, where that's going. why. Yeah. yeah. It's much more likely that you'd have a shark attack, I assume, in like Florida or something. <laughs> yeah. So the reason that they're doing the strip New Jersey is not because of any reason other than that because we need to get Adam to the place where the shark attacks happen from Jaws so he can be freaked out. Right. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the most shark attacks in the United States do happen in New Jersey. Well, I wouldn't be surprised. New Jersey has a lot of fine qualities. Maybe another one is shark attacks. <laughs> All right, so they're going to go summer vacation New Jersey. For three weeks! <laughs> As one does. <laughs> three weeks in Jersey! <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't get over that. Okay, uh, let's move on. <laughs> the next day, Adam wakes up, still worried about sharks in the trip, and decides he needs help. This is where the book got really wild for me and really confusing without having the context of the previous book. So uh -huh. get ready. So he, he looks to his freckles, Gilbert on the left knee, Frankie on the right, Humphrey <laughs> on his right pinky, which are the only ones he knows by name. The only one he knows by name? Like they have names he doesn't know? So, oh boy, Daniel, I have a quote here from the book. I have to read you because uh, otherwise this is, well, it's, it's an amazing quote. As he looked, an idea started to form. Those freckles, those innocent looking little specks, they could protect him. They could be on the lookout for sharks and they could warn him so he'd get out of the water in time. Yes, it was a perfect solution, but it would only work if he could hear them. And these days, Adam couldn't hear them. So, I, what? I don't <laughs> yeah. understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, okay, this is something that's apparently from the first book. And it just gives you this. It just throws you in the deep end here. So this is when the book goes into a little bit of backstory. So last fall, lightning had struck near Adam. And this caused his hearing to become, quote unquote, super sensitive to the point where he could hear his freckles and he made friends with them. Gilbert is a brainy freckle. Frankie is a tough guy. And they helped him play soccer by watching out for the ball and telling him when it was coming. However, he couldn't just hear them shouting out in the open. He needed a conductor connecting his ears to his freckles to talk to them, like a piece of wire or <laughs> being underwater as a conductor. And he could then talk to his freckles. If he was, you know, had his ears underwater and his freckles underwater, they could shout to him or something. I don't know. But apparently it only lasted a few weeks before the sensitivity wore off and he could no longer hear his freckle friends. This is wild. I he might be the only person in existence who can talk to his freckles after a lightning strike. Why would that be surprising, Danielle? It's just like a common thing that happens. Like, oh yeah, he's the only person who managed to hear his freckles no, after a lightning strike. Like, what a weird side of like 
I want to know the author's thought process because lots of things happen during lightning strikes and some people do have like say that they do have like carryover effects after a lightning strike. I don't know if talking to you. I don't think this is supposed to be like brain damage or psychosis. This is not like supposed to be, oh, he got struck near lightning and his brain got fried and he's hallucinating. This is supposed to be he's actually talking to his Right, that's what I mean. It's insane. Like, I just don't understand how the author was like, I have a best idea in the whole world. He can talk to his So now you understand why I brought this book to you, Danielle. Because it starts out just like, oh, a kid is afraid of sharks. It's going to be some conflict. Oh, talking freckles. Uh oh. <laughs> also, the whole conductor thing. Like, why does he need to be? Un- I, I don't know, I don't know if you ever tried to body. listen underwater. Your hearing doesn't work better underwater than it does above water. Like, you don't hear things better. So, <laughs> so I don't understand why that would make his freckles easier to talk to. Not the point. I'm on board from naming his freckles because I don't think that's outside the range of normal. Like 11 year old things. Sure. Yeah. Or, you know, something I would do, but sure. <laughs> All right, Danielle. Well, you're a weird 11 year old. It's fine. <laughs> At heart. I didn't think my freckles could talk to me. Anyway, so you have to accept that that's a thing that happens, Danielle. I'm just going to get over that. Okay. Talking freckles. Got it. So Adam gets up and immediately goes to the pool the next day because he has a plan to sort of talk to his freckles. And again, that's a lot of pool time. Well, you know what? They probably have nothing better to do. Is it nearby, the pool near their house? I have no idea. Does he walk there? I don't know. He oh. doesn't say. He just goes to the pool. It seems like he probably gets there quickly. So I bet it's near his house, in which case it makes perfect sense that he's at the pool all the time. If you say so, Danielle. I'm just calling it. I mean, what else do you have right. to do all the summer when you're a kid? Oh, many other things, I'm sure. No. Anyway, the point is, he's at the pool and he's determined to talk to his freckles. So he puts his ears underwater, like lays back with his head underwater and trying to get his freckles' attention by scratching them, which just seems rude. (laughs) But no dice. He can't hear them. No one's talking because his ears are insensitized. So he decides his best course of action is to resensitize his ears by shuffling across a rug and shocking a doorknob to simulate like a lightning strike. Okay, that's... That's not a lightning strike, but okay. I know, Daniel. This kid is not bright. We'll find out. He tries some crazy stuff. So he goes into like the rec room at the pool, shuffles across the carpet and like touches a doorknob to shock it. Then he runs back outside to see if it works. It doesn't. So then he has a brilliant idea to go back inside, shuffle across the rug, and then put his ear on the doorknob to shock his ear directly. <laughs> Sure. That doesn't work. So then he has the morbid idea to steal some towels from the locker room, wrap them around his feet, shuffle across the carpet with the towels on his feet, and then shock his ears again. Doesn't work. But he does get a lot of really weird looks from everyone watching him do this in the rec room. As one would. So wouldn't it be weird to have talking freckles and then your ears or whatever become unsensitized and then you know your freckles can talk, but you can no longer hear them? That's an existential horror game. Though. That's terrifying. <laughs> that would <laughs> like freak me out. Like what other body parts out. are talking that you can't hear and, and judging you and apparently can – don't didn't worry about it. It doesn't make any sense. And then what if – like so your freckles can talk. Can other body parts talk? I said that. Yeah. Like what else are you missing? Oh my gosh. That's scary. That's scarier than sharks. I don't know what's wrong with this kid. <laughs> I like how this is the part that you're hung up on. The goofy, freckle-talking stuff, not the killer sharks. Well, we haven't gotten to killer sharks yet. So, anyway, after futile attempts and going to apparently many rugs around town trying to shock his ears into working, he gives up and goes home. Why didn't he just stick his finger into a plug or something? Danielle, I don't think he wants to kill himself. No, I'm just saying, like, if, like you just keep repeating the same thing over and over and you're expecting different results from it. You might as well. You went well. to different rugs to see if you could get one that had a better static shock, Danielle. Sure. You tried a couple of times. I would eventually just step up my game. Well, Danielle, this is why you would get yourself a Darwin Award and this kid is still alive. <laughs> I wasn't going to do something that would kill me, just something that would give you yeah, a light yeah. shock. Sticking your finger in a light socket. That's not going to kill him. That's fine. What could work? What's the worst that could happen? <laughs> could, like lick a battery or something. Yeah, because that's going to give you an equivalent of a shot. That's nothing. Well, he's just like static electricity himself. <laughs> that's thousands of volts. A battery is nine volts. We could like rub a balloon on his head. <laughs> How is that different than shuffling across a rug? I don't know, but it seems quicker and easier. Yeah, you just find a balloon, Danielle. Anyway, your ludicrous notions of how to shock your ears aside, he gives up on that idea and goes into his sister's room to look at the various ungens and lotions she has to see maybe if he can find something that will sensitize his ears. What? Yeah, no, he's like, 
uh, electricity didn't work. Maybe I can get something that listens to my ears that is some gooey stuff. I don't I should mention, <laughs> he shares a room with his sisters. They all share a room. Aww. His sister comes in and is like, what are you doing looking at all my stuff? He's like, I need to borrow something. She's like, what do you need to borrow? He grabs a, a bottle of like hair conditioner and pours it in his ears just out of panic. <laughs> what? Why does he think that's going to work? I still don't understand. <laughs> it's not clear, Danielle. This kid, again, makes decisions that are ludicrous. He knows all about shares and stock trading, but has no idea how hair conditioner won't make his ear sensitive by pouring it in there. That's a good way to get but an ear infection. it's important that he does this. This is an important plot point, Danielle. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. Continue. <laughs> his sister is not amused by this. So after failing all weekend, Adam goes back to school the next day for the very last week of school. He is depressed about not getting his freckles to talk to him and still scared of sharks. And then he has the brilliant idea of Dan's vacation of just not going in the water. Oh, Don't go swimming. Sure. Which would have been my first thought way above... <laughs> Talking freckles. Maybe that's me, but that would have been my my problem way above that. But like the first thing I came to. Well, you don't have talking freckles on your side, so. And thankfully, I don't. I'm so happy about that because, <laughs> as you mentioned, terrifying. So he has this great idea not to go in the water. Problem solved. And he's also reserved a slot to play on his friend's game machine. So that's nice. For 50 cents a minute or whatever. 15 minutes, yeah. (laughs) On the downside, his ears are still gunked up with hair conditioner that he apparently didn't wash out of them. (laughs) And the Game Gear's battery dies before it's his turn. So sad day. Oh, he's going to get an ear infection. This is not going to end well. (laughs) It's going to end great. So after lunch, all the kids go to metal shop. And I'm I'm thinking, what elementary school has a metal shop? But maybe that's a Michigan thing, Danielle. Let Uh, me know. My elementary school did not have a metal shop. But that does doesn't mean other elementary <laughs> schools didn't. Well, as a definitive Michigander here, I'm going to call shenanigans then. Yeah, it seems like an odd thing to do with elementary kids, but... It is. But the point is there are outlets on the benches in the metal shop that they can plug the game gear in, so he'll get to play his game. <laughs> Yay! Yay! Or as the author calls it, the video machine. The video machine. The video machine. Several times. I'm pretty it's sure great. we knew they were like video games back in 1996. Well, she literally called it a fancy portable video game machine earlier, so I don't know. And called it a game gear. She called it by name, and now she's calling it the video machine machine. Yeah. So I don't know what changed. I definitely had a fancy portable video machine back in the day. <laughs> I'm sure you did. Point is, while waiting for his turn, Adam gets a soldering iron out and starts soldering his metal shop project. Who gives an 11-year-old to soldering irons to play with? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so Adam finally gets his turn on the game system. He puts in, I'm guessing, like the headphones, maybe their earbuds. It's not clear. When suddenly the sprinklers go off and Adam is shocked unconscious as the video game system shorts out. So wait, he was soldering and then he was playing. Put the soldering night down. You know, after he finished, it was his turn. He got the machine. He started playing on it. The sprinklers went off. Were the they shop sprinklers? The shop sprinklers. Oh, so he's still inside. Yeah, they're in the metal shop. Yeah, sorry. When you said sprinklers, I was like, I went immediately to the outdoors in my head. And I was like, why is he soldering outside? <laughs> Danielle, that's ludicrous. I know, but it didn't and make any book sense. That's why I was clarifying. Insane. <laughs> Nothing in this book doesn't make any sense. So you should give it more credit. Did something happen? Was there a fire? Why did the sprinklers? Well, get there, go? Danielle. Okay. Jeez. Sorry. Well, I didn't know if the book was going to explain it. This book it does not explain many things. It explains everything, Danielle. I just got to give it time. Okay. Sure. Except for how can freckles talk? Doesn't explain that. <laughs> well, maybe you should read shock, soccer shock. <laughs> Y'all, you got there. <laughs> No, the answer to that is no. I like the mystery. (laughs) So Adam is shocked unconscious through the headphones that he's wearing, the earphones, while playing the game. So apparently he had left a piece of paper on the soldering iron when he started playing the game, which started a fire or started some smoke, which set off the sprinklers. Sure. Yeah, which is why you don't give 11-year-old soldering irons. (laughs) Yeah, that's a little wild. So while his parents are concerned for him, Adam's first thought is, when he regains consciousness, is, yay, maybe I can talk to my freckles now. I mean, yeah, that was his goal all along. I told you he should have stuck his finger in a socket. Danielle, you're crazy and don't listen to her children. She (laughs) is not someone who is worth listening to. Yes, children, please don't put your fingers into sockets. It's a bad idea. Because it's important to note that because he had hair conditioner in his ears, they were insulated and that probably saved and helped protect him from the electrical shock through the earphones. Oh, good. See? It all comes back together. That detail is totally necessary for this book. Can earphones shock you? Headphones? I assume that if there's a path, like they're a wire, so if there's an electrical short inside the uh, equipment, it probably could. I don't know. 
Try it, Danielle. Stick a pair of earphones into a light socket while you're wearing them. See what happens. No, I'm good. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> You've been telling people to stick things in light sockets all day. I just said What's that he hesitation? should have been wanted to talk to his freckles. There were other options besides dragging his feet across the carpet. I didn't say there yeah, were good options. Went to just that they were yourself. options. <laughs> he immediately went to suicide, Danielle. It's not an okay thing. You know what? Kids stick their fingers in light sockets all the time and don't kill uh, themselves. <laughs> I don't think that's necessarily true. <laughs> it is. That's why they have those plugs that you put over all of them. So yeah, that, so like, they kids won't stick their fingers that. in sockets. I'm like, oh, this other kid stick a finger in your socket. He's probably going to be fine. Well, it's enough of a problem that they you should never babysit. The... <laughs> okay, first off, I'm a great babysitter. Don't listen to Sam, oh, yeah, everybody. Yeah. Let the kid play with the light sockets. That's a great thing. Get them a butter knife while you're at it. <laughs> I would not let children play with light sockets. And yet you're telling this kid to do so. so. I was just trying to offer him solutions. <laughs> your solutions are terrible. I just I'm thought sorry. it was weird that he didn't up his game after the carpet didn't work. It wasn't cr- very on. critical thinking. Okay. <laughs> Let's move on, Danielle. He's an 11-year-old. He has better ideas, which he's about to execute right now. <laughs> so Adam's like, oh, I got to take a bath to see if I can talk to my freckles. Yeah, I mean, he thinks that. He doesn't say that, but his family won't let him take a bath. <laughs> but he didn't say that. His family's like, no, you can't take a bath. You got to stay in bed. And I'm like, what? Just let the kid take a bath. And what's wrong with that? Does his family know that his freckles can talk? No. Oh, okay. Or at least that he thinks his freckles. He did tell his sister about it, apparently, he says. But she, of course, did not believe that he was telling the truth. Well, I mean, really? Yeah. Although he did tell one of his other friends, who does not appear in this book very much, and she did believe him. Sure, why not? But that's not relevant. Other 11-year-olds would definitely believe you. Yeah, I bet. Anyway, so the point is Adam enlists his sister to help him get his knee and his head into a sink at the same time that's filled with water <laughs> so he can talk to his freckles. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, somehow this is better than a bath. <laughs> like, example, like, no, don't take a bath. But it's just like, okay, stand on my back so you can get your head and knee into a sink at the same time to try to yell at your freckles. Does he need both his ears underneath the water to for this to at work? At least one of his ears. One of his ears. Be a little bit easier, I guess, but still very difficult. No, it's insane. He does it. He hears nothing from his freckles, and Adam is depressed at losing his friends. Oh. And his sister thinks he's very weird. Yeah, well, you're putting your knee and your head into a sink. While standing on your sister's back for no apparent reason is like that. It's a good sister. So a few days later, <laughs> he's back at the pool, and he dives in and hears a bunch of voices. They are super weird. Like before freckles? he dove in, he was standing behind a boy his sister had a crush on. And the voices are like, oh, I don't think he's so good looking. Well, I think he's hot. He's a year older than Catherine, his sister. Older men are fascinating. And it's like, <laughs> what? And all these voices are female voices. Uh-huh. Adam is a lady to be hearing his freckles because he concludes it must be his freckles since no one else is nearby. Okay. And he doesn't know those specific voices, but he knows that they're probably his freckles. There's just like other freckles on his body? He has many freckles, Danielle. He's a freckly boy. Okay. But he can't make contact with Frankie and Gilbert, his freckle friends, due to the other voices which sort of drown them out. So Adam enlists the help of a friend and his younger sister to examine his body for his most distinctive freckles to see which ones are probably making the noise, because he can't look at his entire body, obviously. Obviously. And they conclude there's a grouping on the back of his shoulder that are small and might be the ones that are talking to him. Sure. I mean, why those freckles? Why not other freckles on his body? Danielle, please, that's a question for another book. (laughs) This makes sense to Adam, since his shoulder itches when the freckles laugh. And apparently those freckles are a group of stuck up snobs that refer to themselves as the beauty marks. <laughs> but I'm bumped. This is giving me Heather's vibes, I gotta say. <laughs> I did not expect this from a book called Shark Shock. I know, Danielle. That's why I picked it. <laughs> <laughs> so far, this book has very little to do with sharks. <laughs> almost, almost nothing, Danielle. <laughs> So Adam gets back in the pool and starts to negotiate with the beauty marks. He's like, hey, what are you doing? Why can't I talk to Gilbert and Frankie? And he's doing this by bobbing out of the pool, yelling nonsense at his freckles and diving back under to hear them respond to him. So he has to talk out loud to talk to his freckles. They can't just like hear him. He, they're not psychic, Danielle. No, that's I ludicrous. Just <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm just like trying to learn the rules here for all talking these talking freckles. freckles. Danielle. <laughs> they're not psychic freckles, please. God, they're that's- t- that's, that's that's silly. <laughs> they're attached to his body. Like, I don't know their powers. If they're attached to his body, why does he need to hear them through a medium, Danielle? Come on. It's just weird that he can hear them, but they somehow can't hear him. He can only hear them when he's underwater. Right. And conducts. they're talking to him. So, yeah, he has to have like something connected to his ears. It's not like he can hear them just magically through his body. And they can hear him just fine whenever he talks. So they can hear everything he's doing all day long. Yeah. That's going to be awkward later yeah. in life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Anyway, so he's bobbing up and down the pool, yelling at his freckles and going to listen to him. He's getting weird looks from everybody around him. And so he's talking to the beauty marks. And apparently after he gets a representative to parlay with him, they (laughs) say that they have instigated a revolution against Gilbert and Frankie. The proletariat have overthrown those who (laughs) behaved undemocratic and domineering. What? (laughs) Yeah. And they won't let him talk to the freckles. In fact, they won't let Frankie and Gilbert talk at all because they were too mean and too bossy. What did they can they, they can't move, right? So they're just like no. having these arguments over wide swatches of skin. Yeah, exactly right. And they manage to keep Gilbert and Frankie silent because whenever Gilbert and Frankie try to talk, they'll just yell really loud and drown them out. And so eventually they just gave up talking altogether. That that's that's one way to do that. <laughs> <laughs> the politics are wild. <laughs> freckle politics. Adam is both angry and sad that his freckle friends can no longer speak. Womp, womp. And he's stuck with the beauty marks. So they finally get to the vacation on the coast, and Adam watches nervously from the shore as his family frolics in the water. He feels a bit sorry for himself that he can't join the fun, but he's determined not to get in the water so he can't be eaten by sharks. I'm going to be honest. I actually forgot they were going to New Jersey because I got so sidetracked by the freckle plot. <laughs> Yeah, I figured that might happen. (laughs) And it is halfway through the book before they get to New Jersey. (sighs) What a lame vacation. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's the worst part for you, Danielle, isn't it? The vacation. Well, like... It'd be sad never to go in the water. You're on a beach vacation. You don't get to go in the water. Yeah, fair point. You're afraid of fake sharks that probably aren't in there. I mean, there are sharks in the ocean, Daniel. Let's not... Sure, but they're probably not going to attack you off the coast of New Jersey. Slim to none. Yeah, uh, that's true. They're not going to attack you, but they're, they're there. And so he's just not going in the water, but he has, like, conversation with his freckles now. So couldn't he just go into the water and they would warn him? Wasn't that his original plan? We're going to get to that, Danielle. Okay, Sorry. So he feels a bit sorry for himself that he can't join the fun. But Adam has struck a deal that if he can't talk to his friend, Freckles, Gilbert, and Frankie, that the beauty marks would be his shark early warning system. Although he doesn't fully trust them because they are giggly, silly, and kind of jerks. Sure, but they're also on his body and they don't want to be eaten by sharks either. That's his thought. <laughs> so he's like, all right, let's go in the water. However, this mistrust is well founded for as soon as he does under the water, they start shouting, shark, shark. Oh, there's a shark. Adam freaks out causing a small panic on the beach, which is not received well by anyone else who hears him yelling shark. So they're just like punk beauty marks. (laughs) They're jerks, Danielle. What part of that was not clear? (laughs) No, it was very clear. I just like that they're like being obnoxious to their body's host. (laughs) They don't care. They call him the boy. They don't want him just in my name. We'll get to that. I guess they've never heard of uh, surgery before. (laughs) Danielle, please. This kid's like, I can't wait to get skin surgery on my beauty marks. He's I mean, 11. Okay, yeah, but if if your freckles were that obnoxious, or like he growing up and you could hear them. After getting shocked in his ears maybe twice in his life, and he probably will never hear them again, unless he's continually struck by lightning every few weeks. I might be passive aggressive enough to like get them removed when I was 18. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you are cruel and hold a grudge. How so we is know that, that cruel? They're like really obnoxious. Are they also- Well, you can't hear them. Who cares? <laughs> are they also 11? I guess they are. Probably. <laughs> okay. How does Freckles be older than him, Danielle? I don't know. I had to think that through. <laughs> there you go. I don't know if they age differently than humans do. I, I don't even know how to respond to that. <laughs> Well, different parts of your skin seem to age different. I'm just going to move on before this conversation gets any weirder. So Adam, chastened by his shark crying wolf thing, crying shark crying wolf, retreats under an elevated building that sort of juts out like a pier over the beach, over the shore. And so he's at the edge of the water and he lies down in the shallow water where he starts arguing with the beauty marks about how they're jerks. And he's like, how dare you? That wasn't very nice. And they just sort of laugh at him. And someone, of course, hears him. Is it a shark? Yes, Daniel. A shark hears him. I don't know this story. Maybe he makes friends. A shark on the shore where he's lying in very shallow water hears him. They attack most commonly in shallow water, Sam. (laughs) Yes. Three inches of water is plenty. Okay, we didn't say it was only three inches. (laughs) How else would he be lying on his back with his ears underwater and still breathe where he could yell at his freckles? Because you float. That's what bodies do. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Okay. I'm sorry, Daniel. I wasn't as clear about that. (laughs) Could be a land shark. You gotta stop talking. (laughs) (laughs) That'd be a boring podcast. (laughs) Uh, Probably. Anyway, the person who hears them, a human being, Danielle, not a land shark. (laughs) I don't know where this book is going. Sam has talking freckles. There's like no rules. (laughs) (laughs) There are plenty of rules. The voice introduces himself as Seth, who says that he's out there. Oh, yes, new friend. (laughs) 
How quickly we forget. Oh, well, yeah. Well, I didn't even remember he's going to New Jersey. So why would I remember <laughs> Seth? Why ever would you remember Seth? I should have expected nothing less. <laughs> so Seth says they're out here under this dock area, under this building, because dogs are not technically allowed on the beach, but they won't bother them over here because no one can see them under the building. Sure, sure. Working the rules. So he has rules. his dog with him. His dog is called Spotless because it's a golden retriever. <laughs> That's cute. That is cute, right? <laughs> That's a good name. <laughs> it's a good name. Spotless. <laughs> So Seth is from near Philadelphia, and they get to chatting. Seth visits his aunt at the coast every summer, which is why he's here. And Adam asks, so what's there to do around here besides swimming? And Seth says, you know, not much to do. There's some dances in the building above us, which is a dance hall. And there's also a miniature golf, at which point both he and Adam disparage miniature golf. And I will not stand for that. <gasps> miniature golf no. is great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're like, miniature golf sucks. I'm like, you bite your tongue. <laughs> Uh-oh, I'm impressed you finished this book. <laughs> I was. It was close. I, I almost gave up at this point in indignation. <laughs> That's fair. I, miniature golf is great. Yes, it is. But I let that slide. So then Seth suddenly remembers that he has a haircut appointment, which sounds like an excuse to get out of the date, but here we are. <laughs> and he calls his dog over, and Adam sees that it's a guide dog because Seth is blind. Oh, okay. Yeah, which is another reason he's out there in the dark. He doesn't mind being out in the dark, and this is why he wants to have his dog with him. Mm -hmm. So later, Adam plans to have it out with the beauty marks. He gets home, and his plan is to make Gilbert and Frankie so powerful they can shout over the beauty marks. What? How does that work? How do you, like, empower your freckles? Oh, Danielle. Oh, Danielle, my sweet summer child. <laughs> this kid has a plan. And his plan is foolproof. This story is insane. <laughs> I know. <laughs> his plan is to do this with nerve stimulation so he'll be super energized. <laughs> what? So how he plans to energize his nerves is he turns on the shower, cold. Are freckles attached to nerves? Wait. <laughs> Danielle, everything's attached to nerves. If you well, pinch a yeah, freckle, you'll feel it. Like, it's because it's on your skin, but like the freckle, it's... I, I the just, freckle is part of your skin. They're skin I cells, know, Danielle. I know, but like... I, uh. <laughs> <laughs> I, there's no difference between any other... I mean, obviously they have more melanin, but they're not like fundamentally different cells than your skin. I mean, if they are, that that's a melanoma. That's bad. Right. That's so important. he's... <laughs> He's trying to energize that specific part of his skin, just that area. We'll get to that. So his plan, let's go through the plan, Danielle, so you'll understand okay, his genius. sorry. Continue. <laughs> so he does this by turning on the shower cold, and then he jumps at the shower, yells, and then jumps out again. At which point, of course, his family, his mom and his sister come to the door like, what the heck are you doing? Jumping into and out of the shower in your bathing suit. And he explains that he's trying to energize his nerves. And he's doing this because the shower creates extra ozone, which in turn <laughs> stimulates nerves. And what? I don't think any of that's true. <laughs> Where did he even get that idea from? I don't know. First off, I don't believe showers... It was before Google, so... <laughs> I don't believe showers create ozone. I just don't think that's true at all. I mean, maybe a little bit, but no. Also, I think ozone is toxic in high levels and not necessarily going to energize your nerves. What would happen if he just put, like, band-aids over the beauty marks? They'd have band-aids over them, but they can still shout. I don't think that's going to work. Is it going to make them quieter? I'm just curious. No. I don't know, Danielle. He doesn't think of that. His, his thought goes straight to nerve stimulation. <laughs> Well, yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> Upon hearing his plan to stimulate his nerves for health reasons, his mom merely slowly backs away. <laughs> God, I raised a weird kid. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what she's thinking. So after trying this for several minutes and freezing, Adam lies down in the tub, which he had stopped up so he would collect the cold water from the shower, and tries to get his friends, Frankie and Gilbert, to talk to him. But the beauty marks laugh at him and quickly point out that if he stimulates his nerves, they'll be stimulated as well. So really, this was all futile. Yeah, why would... Let's see. I told you. <laughs> Danielle, yes, you are smarter than an 11 year old. Congratulations. <laughs> Theo superior, Danielle. <laughs> I, do, I mean, that's like the entire premise of are you smarter than a fifth grader? <laughs> now, the entire premise of are you smarter than a fifth grader is to show how adults are dumb. Right. Not, it's the opposite of this, Danielle. <laughs> I'm just saying that the entire premise is like if you pass those, you feel particularly smart somehow. <laughs> no, it's if you fail, you feel particularly dumb. It's well, all about shame. That's true, too. Both. But those questions are not particularly – anyway, that's a dumb show. Let's not talk about it. Let's talk about this book, which is not dumb at all and, in fact, excellent. So while he's having this argument with his freckles about how futile his attempts to stimulate Gilbert and Frankie in isolation were, Adam does talk to a beauty mark named Emily, who seems like a reasonable person. Sure. Or freckle. I don't know. <laughs> it's a freckle. 
I don't think they have, they have personhood. Yeah, they do. And apparently there's ascension in the ranks of the beauty marks between Emily and Jessica, who is like the de facto beauty mark leader tyrant person. It's like the most 90s mean girl names. <laughs> I know, right? It's perfect. So apparently her and Jessica, another beauty mark, don't see eye to eye. Emily sees Jessica as just another bossy dictator, no different than Gilbert and Frankie that she overthrew. And just like, no, they were jerks. And then they tell Adam to go away. They have to talk about this in private. So Adam sits up and drives himself off. What? No! <laughs> yes. He actually respects the decision to have a private conversation. <laughs> The weirdest 11-year-old. <laughs> so later, dejected Adam meets up with Seth. I'm guessing this is another day. I don't know. It's The timeline is, is screwy. And Adam laments to Seth about beauty marks. And Seth is like, well, if you want to get rid of them, what about a lotion or something? And Adam's like, great idea. And so they start to walk to a drugstore to see if they can find like a spot-removing lotion he can apply. See, it's like to... plastic surgery for 11-year-olds. <laughs> right. I'm not saying it was a terrible idea, Danielle. I'm just saying like surgery is not what I would have first gone to. And then I'm like holding a grudge for a decade. <laughs> To then get them removed later is also a little weird. It depends on how obnoxious they were. Probably not for, you know, calling out shark in the water. Uh Uh-huh. So while they're walking, we learn that Seth lost his vision in a boating slash water skiing accident three years earlier. Mm -hmm. And he's like struggling with it. And he feels kind of isolated, but he's doing okay. He's trying to have like that positive attitude. And so we get a little bit about Seth. And this is where the book is kind of like more, not I would say mundane, but more typical. Like everything about the Seth character is very much, you know, this is the interesting thing, a kid overcoming adversity and learning to accept himself and deal with this stuff. That's all very good. It's very well done. But then there's this whole freckle plot, <laughs> like right alongside of it, that's insane. And it's such a weird thing. <laughs> Like, the story is fine. Like, it's a really interesting story about a kid befriending a blind kid and, like, learning to accept his own limitations and, like, his problems overcome his own fears. If this kid can overcome his fears while he's blind, I can overcome my fear of sharks. And so freckles. on and so forth. And <laughs> But then there's freckles that talk and there's a whole thing going on. So it's like, I, I mean, it could have just been about the two kids. It would have been just a perfectly fine book for kids. But suddenly the freckles run there and it's insane. Maybe the freckles are a metaphor. They're not. They literally talk to you. They're not a metaphor. <laughs> So they get to the drugstore and Adam requests a cream to temporarily get rid of his beauty marks because he doesn't want to quote unquote kill them. And this elicits surprise from the drugstore clerk who's like, kill them? What are you talking about? <laughs> and then Adam realizes he doesn't have any money on him. So he's like, all right, well, sorry to waste your time. And they leave. That's the end of that scene. They never, end of the scene. They never go back for the nope. freckle removing cream, which I don't think actually really exists. I mean, there are spot removing creams, but no. Sure, but they like you still Skin gonna have bleaches, freckles that kind of stuff <laughs> yeah yeah but he only wants to get rid of the beauty marks or at least get them to shut up so that he can control them <laughs> chobu's boss anyway so they go back to the beach and then they run along the beach for a while for like 15 minutes apparently and they stop by a wildlife museum and adam reads off the plaques in the wildlife museum to seth after seth pays for them to get in and they go hunt for seashells for a while and talk about how much seth misses colors which is nice but again that's all very good and very interesting, but it's not crazy freckle stuff. I'm not going to really talk much about it because it's not as wild as the rest of stuff. Like, it's good. It's just not what we're here for. <laughs> Get on with the freckles. Exactly. So it jumps forward four days and Adam and Seth are building sand castles. And Seth is probing why Adam's afraid of sharks. And apparently they've all seen Jaws because every kid in this book has seen Jaws. Which seems unlikely by the age of 11. Especially in 1996. <laughs> it was peak Jaws watching time. I guess. But it wasn't like they could just go on YouTube and look up Jaw. Like, their parents had to, like, rent it for them or something. That's true. You had to, like, go to the video store and actually get a copy of it to watch it. Exactly. So while Seth is probing Adam about why he's afraid of sharks, Adam is probing Seth what it's like to be blind. And Seth talks about how he can sort of navigate by echoes and tapping his cane and the dog helps. And how he used to play a little bit of soccer, but he doesn't anymore uh, because he had a beep ball, like a ball that beeps so he could tell where it was. But it just became too much of a hassle. And the other kids sort of like, he felt like he was dragging down the other kids. And it's all very like, oh, that's kind of interesting and nice. But I'm going to gloss right over that again because I want to talk more about the freckles. Because now Adam has an epiphany that Seth can hear very well because he's blind. He has the enhanced hearing, so to speak. Sure. And maybe then Seth could hear his own freckles and use them to help him see. <laughs> so his hearing is so advanced that he could hear freckles now? Well, that's what I like. If, if his ears got sensitized by an electric shock, maybe Seth's ears being naturally sensitized, he could rig it up so he could hear his freckles like with a wire or when they're underwater. Stethoscope. And his freckles could be like his stethoscope? No, he hasn't, Daniel. He doesn't have a stethoscope. <laughs> But he wants basically to give Seth seeing eye freckles. Sure, yeah, as as one does. 
So Adam spills the beans about everything, about how he was pranked by the beauty marks, about how his freckles talked to him. Did he explain he was hit by lightning almost? Yeah, he explains he was hit by lightning or shocked by the game gear, all that stuff. And Seth kind of just goes along with it and is impressed that the freckles can see, which is a valid point. How do the freckles see, Danielle? I I don't know. I'm assuming they don't have like ocular nerves. (laughs) No, they're freckles, Danielle. The skin cells. Can they see? Does it is it clear in the story? Yeah, they see because they help them like navigate. They help them see the soccer ball coming, and they were there to help them see when sharks were coming. That's a whole oh, idea. That's true. Well, maybe they could just sense it. I don't know, Sam. Right. I'm sorry. You're not familiar with the shark <laughs> sensing abilities of freckles. <laughs> I don't know. I I don't know. (laughs) Anyway, it's a valid point that Seth has about Freckles being able to see. Still, Seth takes this very well. And they don't know. They don't answer that in the book, I'm assuming. Of course not. Does he just say, I don't know? What? Don't know about what? When he asks. When Seth asks how they see. No, no, no. He just says he's impressed they can see. He doesn't ask how they see. He's just like, I'm impressed they can see. And then the author was like, "Uh I'm not going to write it in there. Danielle, please, we're not, this is, I think there's enough techno babble. We don't have to go into like, yes, freckles have special miniature nerve eye cells evolve after decades of radiation exposure from ultra. I don't know, Danielle. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't need to make sense. Just go with it. I'm, I'm going with it. I'm, I'm this far in. All right. So Seth takes all of this very well and they go into the water together. So Adam won't have to rely on the beauty marks to watch out for sharks because Seth can watch out for a shark. Adam doesn't really know how this works, but he feels better having Seth around anyway. Sure. I mean, Seth can't see the sharks coming, but he can sense them, perhaps, <laughs> according to this book. I think, I think it's mostly about the moral support. <laughs> right. That Seth I'm offers. agreeing. I think, I think so, too. So then they try to see if Seth can hear his freckles. He goes underwater and, like, scratches them to get their attention. No good. He's just got good hearing because he's blind, not because he's electrically shocked, Adam reasons. So maybe this won't work. But then Adam is starting to see dorsal fins out in the water. Uh-oh. And he starts to panic. Are they dolphins? Seth calm- Calms him down and asks, you know, are they moving up and down? Are they in a group? It's like, okay, they're dolphins, not sharks. Don't panic. <laughs> what a good job, Seth. Yeah, Seth is a great friend. He then uh, invites Adam to a beach party he's going to throw the next day and to bring his sisters. And Adam says, I thought you said girls don't usually like you. To which Seth replies, that doesn't mean I don't like them. And you go, Seth. <laughs> I appreciate the hustle. <laughs> Seth is great. He's probably the uh, best character in the book. I was kind of rooting for Seth and Freckle Boy. His name is Adam Daniel. I've been saying it a million times. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I completely forgot it. I figured. So the next day, they go to the party, and Adam is there with Nora and Catherine, his sisters, and he's waiting, and Seth comes up, and he introduces himself to the sisters, and he flirts a little with Catherine, because they're about the same age. Mm-hmm. So good on you, Seth. You go for it. And then Seth's aunt comes, and she drops off a bag of mysterious party supplies before rushing off, and these kids spend a lot of time I'm just alone on a beach in New Jersey. Okay, I'm actually going to call this because I <laughs> we'd go spring breaks in Florida sometimes and uh, it was about that age, like 11 to 13, and they would just leave us alone. We would like wander yeah, but- the boardwalks by ourselves, like go to video game arcades and like do but his sister is six his younger sister is six. yeah i don't think it would have mattered like even if I'd ha- we'd had younger kids with us like they just assumed that we would take care of all the kids so you're saying all midwestern parents are responsible kind of <laughs> 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 we definitely just hung out they assumed that if we were all in a group we were fine <laughs> Well, I guess that's something else they learned. Thank you, Daniel. You're welcome. And like, if you're an older sibling, then you take care of the little ones anyway. It's just kind of like part of your daily existence. All right. Sure. I guess I'm the one wrong about this. Okay. I'm just saying, especially in the 90s, I don't think it was that weird. (laughs) Okay. So it turns out that the bag that Seth's aunt brought contains a birthday cake for Seth. Oh, yeah. And this is a traditional month before your birthday party that his aunt throws for him every year because he stays there just long enough, but he goes home before the birthday happens. I so want a month say, before my birthday party. <laughs> you want to, you would do that every day before your birthday if you could. I really like birthdays, but I I know. <laughs> How much fun would that be? It's like there's unbirthday parties too, Danielle. This is a thing that already exists. I know, but I should have more of them. It's a great idea. Okay, well, good luck on that. I probably won't attend. <laughs> I'm not going to invite you, so there. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> So Seth has Nora put the candles on the cake and then blows them out, but one doesn't go out. It's a trick candle. <laughs> and he tries to have the other kids blow it out before finally the little sister spits on it because gross. <laughs> do you think trick candles, you know how you do birthday wishes and you blow your candles out? Do trick candles yes. like ruin your wish? If Concerning that- wishes are all just uh, superstitions anyway, Dana, I'm not sure it matters. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. Can't even hypothetically go with me. <laughs> 
Sorry, Danielle. I will, I will tolerate talking freckles. I will not talk, tolerate these shenanigans. This is what I put up with everybody. <laughs> Ask oh, yeah, a hypothetical question and you get so rational about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. Everyone has seen in this episode how much you have to put up with. <laughs> it's true, though. I think people are on my side. We both put up with a lot, Danielle. Let's be honest about <laughs> Twitter that. Twitter poll. Think, okay, that's not fair because you're running on Twitter. <laughs> well, who puts that's up with more on the sampling. podcast, Sarah Danielle? <laughs> All right, Danielle. I think if we're going to get into this right now, it's a bad idea. <laughs> I think we both can agree that we put up with a lot from either people. Like, we're going to put up with re- from you right now. This is brattiness. <laughs> I'm a little bratty, especially yeah. today. Continue on, please. Freckles, okay. sharks, birthdays before birthdays. Good summary, Danielle. <laughs> so, Nora spits on the cake. It's Ew. gross. I'm not sure if there's any relevance to this cake thing. Uh, we move on. So, Adam had brought a little gift for Seth, not knowing it's his birthday, but just because he's a good dude. And it's a volleyball that he stabs and rips open and then pours a bunch of little bells into the ball uh-huh. and then reseals it with glue to make a ball that Seth can locate audibly. So, he makes something like a little, Aww. they call the jingle ball, That's which cool. is kind of cute. Yeah. And so they play a little bit of soccer on the beach, and it's all very sweet. The next day, they're waiting for Seth at the beach, and he's late. It's Saturday, and when he shows up, he looks uneasy, and his dog isn't with him. Adam sees he's being followed by two other kids, who are about the same age, and as he watches, one of the kids runs up and punches Seth on the shoulder. Jeez. Yeah. Does his dog get eaten by a shark? Yes, Daniel. His dog get eaten by a shark. I'm just, I don't know. I'm just trying to figure <laughs> out where the sharks come into this. <laughs> They've already come into it, Danielle. <laughs> There are no more sharks. <laughs> there are as many sharks in this book as there need to be. <laughs> okay, sorry. Seth's getting beaten up. I should pay more attention. <laughs> yeah. Two, two kids bullying a blind kid. This is not okay. <laughs> well, bullying anybody's not okay. Yeah, bullying anybody. This is like especially heinous. Yes, I agree. So Seth stops and he turns around and is addressing them. They can't hear him because he's a little far away. And then one of the kids spits in his face. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is where the book gets really weird. I mean, really intense weird. So Adam and his sister Catherine rush up to Seth to help. And Seth is you know, not having it. He says, to go away, damn it. I'll handle it. And this is when the boys start taunting a lot of them. And this gets very vulgar. Like, they basically like, say, oh, is this your girlfriend, Seth? And they say, like, oh, her breasts are too small, but they use a much more vulgar term for breasts. I'm like, what? This is out of left field. <laughs> that this suddenly got very graphic and kind of crude. Especially for a younger book. Younger yeah, book. like this like, book for like eight-year-old and suddenly they're like talking about all this crazy stuff and using foul words and everything which is you know fine that happens but just i was not expecting it it just came completely out of the field and otherwise very sort of lighthearted and goofy novel mm-hmm. so this is when seth throws a punch at one of the kids and attacks them and gets one of them in a headlock while adam jumps on the other and starts wailing on him and Catherine runs off to get help so they fight for a while and the two boys overpower adam and seth kicking them a bit and then steal seth's hat and run off before Catherine gets back with the lifeguard <laughs> That's wild. Seth's only there for, like, the summer, right? He's there for, like, three months in summer, yeah. How did he make, like, enemies so quickly? Well, nothing. Like, these aren't kids he knows. They just happen to be, like, jerks, and apparently he has run to people like them before, if not those specific people. That's sad. Yeah. Real, real condemnation of the state of affairs of children in the New Jersey Shore. <laughs> apparently. So Seth is very upset. He doesn't want to talk about it and he just wants to go off alone. Adam, however, goes off after Seth and won't leave him alone. So Seth finally breaks down and tells Adam that he's sick of being dependent. He's sick of how people treat him differently and how they're constantly helping him. Like coming to his help with those bullies when he could have handled it, he could have talked them down. He's done it before with other people. And he didn't need their help and you shouldn't help me just because you feel sorry for me because I'm blind. Okay, but they're also his friends. <laughs> Well, so Adam says, that's complete BS. I helped you not because I felt sorry for you, but because that's what friends do. They help each other. And so they hash it out and they come to an understanding and they're all friends again. And Seth confessed that he is jealous of Adam. He was hoping he could hear his freckles too, so they could help him see, even if it was kind of a ludicrous idea. <laughs> and Adam decides that he's going to help Seth talk to his freckles one way or another. Yeah. So they go out swimming and they start brainstorming ways to get Seth to hear his freckles without needing to electrocute him. Because, <laughs> Danielle, that's a bad idea. <laughs> Maybe he'd only need a light static shock because he's already a super sensitive hearing, apparently. So Adam decides that he's going to talk to the beauty marks to see if he can get them to let Gilbert and Frankie help, at least temporarily, so that they'll lift the moratorium on them talking. Adam asks if they ever try talking to Gilbert and Frankie before isolating them because of Seth's idea that you can talk things out instead of resorting to violence. How come he can only hear these, like, 
handful of freckles. Doesn't he have- so the only ones who are yelling at him. They're keeping everyone else down. All of them? I mean, the entire yeah. body of freckles? There's like Apparently three yell, girls or whatever that are like louder than your entire body of freckles? Well, they're the ones who are talking, but they can't all shout at once. They used to all shout at the same time. It's like, stop, I can't understand any of you, so I'm only going to talk to a representative at a time. Oh, okay. So Emily and Jessica argue, with Jessica being bossy about like not having to have a personal relationship with Adam. Don't call him by his name. Call him the boy. <laughs> and there's no talking with Gilbert and Frankie because they're jerks. There's no even reason to even try. And Emily points out that's pretty much the same thing that Jessica's accusing Gilbert and Frankie of doing, which is being bossy and, and domineering. And considering they're dependent on this dude's body, you think that they'd be a little nicer to him? I don't think that really enters into the equation at all, Danielle. <laughs> Fairly not. <laughs> no. Emily suggests they should have a meeting, and Adam agrees to arbitrate this meeting between Gilbert, Frankie, and the beauty mark to try to come to an agreement. And they agree, and at long last, Adam gets to finally speak to Gilbert and Frankie before the arbitration. So, yay! So, they, she agreed because Emily was telling her that there was she was being too bossy? I mean, Emily's like, we should talk to them and see if we can come to some kind of agreement. And Jess is like, fine, but I'm not promising anything. Okay. But they at least let them talk long enough to address the arbiter before the arbitration. <laughs> like freckle lawyers and mediators. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> The entire township on his body. So Adam asserts that Frankie and Gilbert should apologize for being kind of domineering and bossy, and that the other freckles vote on decisions. What decisions do freckles have to make, Danielle? I don't well, know. They apparently, but apparently have an entire it's a thing. like living situation going on. <laughs> It's crazy. There's a whole society here that I don't understand. I'm assuming they don't like, do they hold down roles in, in this society other than being in charge? Unclear. Maybe that's addressed in the previous book, Sucker Shock, but I don't know. <laughs> so while Adam is doing this, he's bobbing up and down the water, bringing his head up to yell at his freckles and diving under, and Seth is just sort of looking at him weird and being like, it's so weird just hearing one side of a conversation and you're yelling at your freckles, <laughs> whatever. I like that he just goes along with it. Seth's like, yeah, yeah it's totally, totally legit. Why not? But Adam finally gets Frankie and Gilbert to apologize, and they all come to an understanding, and they bury the hatchet. So yay, Yay. Freckles are all friends again. And so Adam asks his Freckles to tell Seth's Freckles to shout. Shout so loud that he can hear them, even if he isn't as sensitive as if he got electrically shocked. However, his Freckles inform him that they can't help him. They tell him, quote, Your relationship with us is a special thing. Everybody's different. We can't interfere. And that has implications. <laughs> can't interfere with what? <laughs> I don't know. The relationship between Seth and his freckles, it's like so many implications about the freckle lives and their relationship with people. There's so much going on here, Danielle, that's unanswered. <laughs> I don't understand this at all. <laughs> so Seth accepts that he won't be able to talk to his freckles, like for whatever reason, they either don't want to talk to him or he can't hear them. It's unclear about what's going on, but he is left without satisfaction. So finally, we get to the next chapter, where Adam is at home eating dinner with his family. And throughout this book, his sister Catherine has been mentioning that she wants to get her own room, because she's a 13-year-old girl living with her younger brother and younger sister, and that's got to be rough. Yeah, I'd agree. <laughs> yeah. And Poor so kid. Adam doesn't want that to happen, because he doesn't want like things to change. Like his mom's been talking about going back to work, his sister's talking about moving out of their shared room, everything's changing, oh no, I can't handle it. He's going to have a rough life. Yeah, exactly. So he's freaking out about this. And the parents drop the bomb during dinner that they are going to give a a new room to somebody, but it's going to be Adam because he's a boy and a boy needs his own room. What? Yeah. What? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's such BS. I mean, I don't think like it kind of makes sense to potentially separate out the genders, maybe, but like not in that the way you phrase that. (laughs) What they say is... The parents are like, we're going to give Adam his own room because he's a boy and he's, and he's going to get the spare room because, quote unquote, after a certain age, boys and girls shouldn't share rooms. Yeah. Which, okay, but also, <laughs> oof. <laughs> I'm calling shenanigans on that. You know, it's, it's very sexist. It's not great. No. <laughs> that poor teenage girl. Yeah. Yeah. And also they say that when the grandfather visits, he can share a room with Adam because he comes and stays from like Thanksgiving to Easter, which is a long time. That is a really long time. He can share a room with Adam where he couldn't share a room with one of the girls. And also, wow. He just needed so, a bigger house. Yeah. It's kind of weird. And they're like, oh, Catherine, you can stay. You'll, you'll grow up being friends with Nora, your younger sister, where Adam couldn't. I'm like, 
what are you doing? She still needs privacy. She still needs her own space. She's not just because she's a girl and, and her little sister's a girl doesn't mean that they don't need any privacy. Yeah, there's got to be a better solution to that. Well, the parents don't have one. <laughs> That's sad. I feel bad for her. Yeah, no, I feel really bad for Catherine. They mollify Catherine by telling her that they'll turn part of their unfinished basement into like a hangout room, like a rec room, where they'll like put down a carpet and, and put a sofa bed in there for Catherine to bring friends over and, and she can retreat there. But it's like, that's not the same. It's not. Can, can she not have a bedroom down there or one of the kids? It's unfinished basement. So basically it's going to like put up a curtain and some and a rug down and a sofa. Like it's not like there's an actual room down there. Well, maybe they should make it into one. I don't disagree, but I think there's also a money problem. Like they're saying we have to sure. sell the the, the bunk bed so we can buy the sofa bed but we'll make it all work well and then they're planning a three-week vacation to new jersey <laughs> well maybe this is why they're going to jersey to i'm sure it's not the priciest vacation destination <laughs> yeah that's true but i feel really bad for Catherine from all of us because she's just like what my younger brother who doesn't even want his own room is actually starts crying at the table because he doesn't want to get his own room <laughs> And they're like, Adam, deal with it. He's like, fine, I guess I'll learn to live with it. And Catherine's like, well, this is some BS, but whatever, I guess. That's wild. I was like, no one is happy about this. What a terrible solution. What terrible parenting. <laughs> I know. Catherine, I know you're getting to be a young woman and you need some privacy, but we're going to give it to your younger brother instead because he's a boy. Who and boys want, get what they want. <laughs> Yeah. It's awful. And yeah, I'm sure Adam would need his own room eventually in a year or two, but seriously, there's there's got to be a better solution. There has to be. Anyway, with that settled and Adam coming to terms with everything changing around him, it's time for Adam and his family to leave New Jersey. He goes out to see Seth one last time to say goodbye. He tells Seth they're leaving really early in the morning after Seth complains about having to get up so early because they want to spend a few days in New York City and his dad wants to get there early to shop around for a cheap place to stay, which is a bold choice. Even for 1996, <laughs> just going to New York to find a hotel to stay in without a reservation or any pre-planning. I mean, good luck, buddy. <laughs> I'm assuming it works out fine. I mean, maybe. I don't know. I don't think they're going to find a really good deal on a place without a reservation in advance. <laughs> so Adam is saying goodbye to Seth. They're underneath that same elevated building where they first met. They go swimming a little bit and they discuss Adam visiting again next year. And now that his mom is working full time, they can afford to take the vacation again. So he sort of comes to terms with her going back to work. And as they dive underwater, Adam hears his freckle singing. Gilbert had the idea to form a freckle chorus. <laughs> which, sure, why not... <laughs> And that's the end of the freckle story, at least. Really? <laughs> yep, that's the last we hear about the freckles. I don't understand why this why this book has sharks in the title. <laughs> because he's afraid of sharks, Danielle. That's the impetus for all of this. That's dumb. After they get out, Seth gives Adam his watch, which is like a braille watch that he can feel the hands are as like a gift, because Adam has never owned a watch. And Adam gives Seth a necklace with a shark tooth on it, and they part. Aww. The end. See? They're cute together. They're good friends, Danielle. So like I said, I think this book is a sweet book. I think it has a lot of good sort of stuff about friendship and acceptance. I don't know why the freckles are in there. I have no idea how that plays anything into this, but they're there. I can't believe you don't want to read the first book and find out. I don't know, Danielle. It feels like it'll just be more we're the same. I mean, yeah, but with soccer, maybe. Yeah. Okay, maybe you should read Soccer Shock, Danielle, and tell me, <laughs> does it answer all the big questions? This has become a trend with us, Danielle, where I talk about something, and you're going to read the 13th Warrior book and tell me if you answer all the questions from the 13th Warrior, and you can read Soccer Shock and tell me if you answer all the questions from Shark <laughs> That's like Shock. a whole different podcast. <laughs> I'm okay with it, Danielle. We, I mean, you're the one who seems interested in getting all these answers. I'm happy with the mystery. I like that this exists as its own out-of-context book about some weird freckles that have, you know, a few pages of actual book space, but are somehow the focus of a lot of intrigue. That's a weird, what an odd choice <laughs> <laughs> in your middle grade fiction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. I did not see that coming when I read this book. I actually remember being like, what with all those weird freckles? <laughs> I'm really disappointed there were not more sharks in this book. You actually expected to be a shark attack in a well, book about kids in New Jersey Shore. more to do with sharks once they got to New Jersey. Why? Because <laughs> it's called Shark Shock. <laughs> well, the shock comes from shocking his ears, and there are sharks that are the main fear that he has to overcome that drive it. Sure. I, I like get the concept, but I, I think it oversells the book. <laughs> You think there's not enough shark in it? Yeah, there's not enough shark. Like, you would pick up that book because you're like, oh, cool, I like sharks. And then there's no real sharks in this book. Well, there is a whole little essay about sharks at the beginning, so I hope that's yeah, good enough. Yeah, but he enough. doesn't even see a shark once. He does see dolphins, and yeah, that's pretty close. No, they're completely different creatures. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Danielle, I'm aware. <laughs> well, your issues with the name aside, what would you call it then? I don't... 
I have no idea. I'm not saying that the title is necessarily bad. I just think it likes it sells it in a way that the book is not actually being portrayed in real life. Are you saying that there's like a misleading, false advertising type title? It is kind of, yeah. Well, I'll take it up with Donna Napoli, I think. Yep. Napoli, however it's pronounced. And she might not have been in charge of her title. The authors That's don't true. always write their titles. That's a good point. Also, Danielle, it's a companion book to Soccer Shock, <laughs> so it has to have that same alliteration. <laughs> I wonder if Soccer Shock really has anything to do with, like, soccer. He plays soccer in the book and his freckles help him, Danielle. I assume it must. Must help him overcome something in the first book. Well, they help him become a better soccer player. Yeah. That's what it's about. I'd assume. Uh, at least what I've gathered from this book is that's what it's about. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they help him overcome overcome like some evil real estate <laughs> developer trying to tear down the rec center or something i don't know it's possible talking <laughs> freckles wild i know right out of nowhere talking <laughs> freckles that have very little to do with the plot of this book like none of the interpersonal relationships are really affected by the freckles it's almost better that the titles don't have anything to do with the freckles so that they come out of left field yeah. no it's the best thing because <laughs> you're just like okay it's gonna be a standard book about a kid you know trying to be friends and learning how to deal with his fears and talking freckles okay well here we go and then back to the kid just being a kid oh talking freckles again and not just talking freckles but freckles with like intense body politics (laughs) yeah it is so uh, i really would love like if there was a a book that was like a freckle level perspective like written from the freckles point of view about the politics of the freckles and like here we are on the shoulder day-to-day life with the freckles and like their world like a um magic school bus episode (laughs) kind of like i was thinking more like an osmosis jones yeah that was the first thing i thought of too actually but with freckles. Yeah. Oh, that was a book. Good job, Sam. That was a book. So questions that we have from this book mostly are shark-related from the very first <laughs> section about yes. are those facts, actual shark facts. Please let us know. Come on, people. <laughs> <laughs> we are wallowing in ignorance. We need you to this save us. This is our third shark-related episode, and we still don't have shark answers. <laughs> To be fair, Danielle, all of our shark-related episodes have nothing to do with, like, actual shark facts and are all nonsense <laughs> movies about sharks. <laughs> People have not told us whether or not these shark facts are real or not. I know Maybe Google us, would Danielle. solve this problem, but <laughs> <laughs> there's got to be somebody out there who really likes sharks that can just tell us. Yeah, most 11-year-olds would love to tell you all about the shark facts they know. Like, the dinosaurs and shark facts are all about it. That's true. All right. Well, if you have an 11-year-old or young cousin, brother, friend that you you can mine for shark facts, let us know. We'd love to hear from them. (laughs) We would be happy to talk to the 11-year-old as well if they just want to tell us all their shark facts. (laughs) Oh, I 100% am down for that. (laughs) So if you have any of those, you can contact us at bookretorts.com. Or you can Facebook, tweet us, Instagram us at bookretorts. So until next time, don't be startled by your talking freckles. Bye. (laughs) Take care, everybody. You had a lot of questions in that episode. Well, that's because Talking Freckles, Sam, in a shark book. (laughs) I love the book because the sharks are as incidental as the Talking Freckles. (laughs) It's just bizarre.